Hello, welcome to the final episode in this series of Smart Coffee Break, the productivity podcast brought to you by Nestle Coffee Partners. In this podcast series, we've been looking at how we work, what makes us productive, and how we're going to collaborate in the future. My name is Jeremy Myerson, writer, academic, and director of Work Tech Academy. And it's been my privilege to be your guide to the new world of work that is now starting to emerge. In compiling this series, I've been talking to a range of experts in the field about what happens next, from workplace strategists to behavioral scientists. Today, I want to reflect on what I've been hearing and what I've learned in the company of one of the world's foremost thought leaders on workplace culture and the future of work. My special guest is Bruce Daisley, author of the Sunday Times bestseller, The Joy of Work, and famous for his own podcast, Eat, Sleep, Work, Repeat. Bruce spent 12 years running Twitter in Europe, and before that, he worked at YouTube in the UK. Bruce, it's great to have you uh, as a guest on this podcast. Can we start by getting some sense from you on what's been happening to company productivity during the pandemic? A report from the Economist Intelligence Unit suggested that companies were split right down the middle on whether productivity has gone up or gone down. What do you think has been going on? Measuring productivity is like uh, it's, it's like this will-o'-the-wisp, it's a very hard thing to pin down. And fundamentally, it goes to the heart of us understanding whether new ways of working are effective or not. Until we actually get an effective way to measure productivity, we get lost in our own biases, our own instincts, our own maybe desires for presenteeism, and uh, actually working out what someone is being asked to do and whether they are doing it is this elusive but such incredible requirement, I think, for all of us going forwards. Um, so yeah, you, you raise a really interesting question. You know, one of the things that I heard from people is that productivity went up at the start of the pandemic and then down later on as maybe burnout kicked in or some of the productivity gains were gained by us working longer hours. Strictly speaking, that's productivity going down if we've worked longer hours. So I think you get to the heart of one of the interesting and open questions that we've got right now. In trying to measure productivity, we're trying to now measure it in a wider world of work where people are not necessarily having daily attendance at the office. How do you think you can get metrics for productivity when people are working remotely in third spaces and they're only maybe coming to the office a day or two a week? For me, it's, it's largely about what job are you asking someone to do and have they done it? And I think actually, if we got more focused on that, we'd take a very different perspective of the amount of meetings we ask people to attend. We'd take a very different perspective of the amount of emails that we're creating for people. By one report in management today, pre-pandemic, it was estimated that the average worker was spending, um, I think, 16 hours a week in meetings. I strongly suspect that that figure is too small now. And if we've got a situation where people are effectively maybe losing, sacrificing two or three days a week of their working week to meetings, then we might ask, what is the productivity of meetings? So it begs a really important question. What is someone employed to do and how are they doing it? Um, in our first podcast, we talked to Despina Katsikakis of Cushman and Wakefield, and she's an expert on the history and origins of productivity. She's done a lot of research in the, in the area, and she makes the link um, between how much autonomy somebody has in their job and how much interaction um, they have with others. And this relationship between autonomy and interaction is a very a uh, relevant one, because in the pandemic, um, people were given more autonomy because they were working from home in their own space to their own time, um, but they had dramatically less interaction with others. And Despina's big argument was that we need to get people back to the office because that is the place for face-to-face -face 
interaction and high levels of interaction stimulate productivity. I wonder what your view is on that position. Uh, autonomy control is one of the biggest influencers of our sense of well-being. In fact, you know, if if people are experiencing burnout, it's quite often because they feel no control over their their personal situation. They might open their calendar on a Monday morning and ha, oh, what a hot mess. They've got 20, 30 hours of video calls. They immediately feel breathless. They feel like they can't cope with the week. Why? Because an absence of control is one of the biggest influences on our well-being. I think for me, I would separate the importance of, of interactions. I think a lot of us have found ourselves in jobs now where we have no control. I've, I've been uh, consulting, helping one big technology company. And the experience of a lot of the people who work there is that they say we have no control. Effectively, we're sort of, we're, we're a bit like we're playing mum and dad. We're dressing up in the clothes. We're, we're attending all the meetings, but none of us are allowed to do anything. So, you know, we, we sort of end up nitpicking each other's work we end up sort of appraising what's going on around us but none of us are allowed to choose the destination um and i think you know it begs an interesting question about could we run any of our organizations in a different way one of the things that seems to be most interesting is that when you can create small autonomous units in companies small teams that can get stuff done that can make decisions it's when people feel closest to being um inspired and motivated by their jobs in our second podcast, we spoke to the neuroscientist, Dr. Fiona Kerr in Adelaide, and she talked about flow and focus and getting yourself in a creative state of concentration. Do you think, Bruce, that there's been too much emphasis on collaboration and teamwork at the expense of being able to get your head down and do some private work? Resolutely, yes, I do. So too much emphasis on being part of a team. Most people now, when they're asked to describe their working environment, they report that they're part of a team. But the consequence of that is that they, people feel that they have no influence over the things that they do in their jobs. They, they feel that they've maybe got a contributory role to play, but they're not making decisions. They're not, they're not able to steer specifically actions. And the consequence of that is that we feel disengaged from our jobs. That experience of being in a bureaucracy ends up with people feeling like, I can't get anything done here. I'm going to ask a manager to ask their manager's permission to get anything done. And so we, we as a consequence of that, we just feel sadly like our, our best ideas, our best problem solving isn't able to be brought to bear on the, the jobs that we're doing. Turning to the physical construct of the workplace, we had a fascinating podcast with uh, Simon French, who was the head of workplace and design at GlaxoSmithKline. And it was really an insight into life inside a life science company trying to innovate at speed and optimize their teamwork. And he talked about an office full of desks giving way to much more of a kind of social ecosystem in which people work in different spaces on terraces and in libraries and they have an opportunity to refresh and engage uh, within their team. Do you think offices are going to have more collaboration zones and less rows of desks or is that just too simplistic? The organisation that really looks at offices and, and gives them a rating, gives them sort of a sense, uh, a, a score is called Leesman. They're like the Michelin guide of offices. They sort of tell you whether you've got an elite office or, you know, an okay office. And one of the things that they say is that they say the office of the future will be half the size, but twice the experience. I think all our interviewees talked about providing better food and refreshment, better coffee, better printing, better Wi-Fi, uh, more connectivity, you know, you've got to make the office experience better than the, the, the experience you have at home. In our fourth podcast, we talked to the Silicon Valley designer, Primo Orpia, and he recognised the irony of Silicon Valley being a place of military research and development, command and control hierarchy. When they started producing software and computers, the companies in the Valley switch to a much more fluid, more flat, more democratic organisational structures in order to kind of make innovation uh, move faster. What do you think in the new era is going to happen to 
leadership and team structures and that kind of company culture. Um, are we on the verge of big change or is it going to be slow or how do you see things? Yeah, be, beware the distraction of Silicon Valley firms. Firstly, a lot of them have found that their workers are very unhappy with their answers to the new world of work that we're getting yeah. into. And then next thing is, you know, next time you're sitting there thinking Silicon Valley firms, they, they're the firms to emulate. Ask yourself the last new innovation that Google brought to you or the last new innovation that you saw from some of these big tech firms. So, uh, so, so, so beware, you know, sometimes a very profitable business model disguises a lot of bureaucracy behind the scenes. I think the thing that we know is what we've talked about along the way here, that when we can empower semi-autonomous units, units where people feel that they they know their colleagues, they build a rapport with their colleagues, and that rapport doesn't necessarily have to be all the time face-to-face, -face, but they've got some affiliation with, with their colleagues, then we unlock the holy grail and what this is all about. This is all about workplace motivation. The firms of the future are going to be the ones who seek to unlock that now. Now, what might that look like? Well, it might look like doing an audit saying, look, you know, our employees tell us they're unproductive because they're spending 20 hours a week in meetings. What can we do to reduce that? Meetings generally go up uh, with organisation size. The more we can enable workers to get their jobs done and not feel like they've got to tell everyone, keep everyone in the loop. I think that's where you liberate workers to get their, their most productive, energised, inspired work done. You talk about formal meetings being pretty much unproductive, and I think that will strike a, a note with a lot of people. But in our fifth podcast, we talked to Christy Woolsey of Boston Consulting Group, and she was talking about the serendipitous encounter, the bump factor in offices, running into somebody at the coffee point or the water cooler, and this being a spur to company performance. In fact, in Boston Consulting Group's New York office, they introduced a metric called the collision coefficient because they wanted people to bump into each other. Do you think this um, chance encounter culture has been kind of overplayed or is it an important part of, of, of the future of work? I think most people, if they were asked to revisit closed circuit television camera footage from their office in February 2020, would struggle to point out to the editors, the, the, the people who were compiling a show based on this, they would struggle to point out the best bits that would demonstrate that, you know, live footage of people hunched over their, their desktop computers, answering emails. I think you'd struggle to say, oh, there's one of those, those, innovation moments oh there you go that you've just witnessed the birth of a great idea because these things live far more vividly in the brochure for the way that we're selling the office than in the day-to-day -day experience yeah. but it raises a really important point there's actually good evidence by um, a wonderful academic at, at massachusetts institute of technology a guy called alex pentland and he looked at the way that offices functioned and he said at, there is evidence that face-to-face -face conversations achieve something that meetings don't, where effectively, because there's no power dynamic there, we do seem to have really creative conversations that connect teams that often don't spend time together. That was one of the interesting things. These innovations often live in the, the lines between the train tracks, and they, they're often when a marketing team goes over to the product team and the conversation happens in a way that hadn't been mandated by anyone. Just finally, in a nutshell, um, companies are asking all the time, you know, how can we maintain and improve performance? What are the two or three simple steps that you would advise them to take if, they, if they're really serious about their performance? These two critical components that we've we're starting to understand this productivity and this cohesion. And these two things together are a dynamite combination. So, what have we learned over the last 12 months? We've learned that people, far more than in open plan offices, can get their job done from home. You know, they without distractions, without interruptions, when they're enabled to, to build the flow that you talked about earlier. Um, effectively, that people feel that they can they can achieve productivity. But what we miss there is we miss any sense of togetherness. We miss any sense of belonging. And people are finding that they're 
connection to an organization is is less substantial than ever before. The best organizations will say, we want you to feel productive, able to get things done, powered with a sense of autonomy, but also you feel part of something bigger than you. Bruce Daisley, it's been a great pleasure to listen to your views and also to get your reflections on what we've learned from Smart Coffee Break, the productivity podcast brought to you by Nestle Coffee Partners. I suppose at the end of this series, I'm left with a strong sense of the social dimension of work, the importance of having personal autonomy and control, the need to work where you want in the way you want. We set up this podcast series to examine the design factors that shape performance. And in that nexus of choice, autonomy, and social connection, we find some of the reasons that enable people to do their best work. And also the links between the science of workplace productivity and the culture of coffee. I'm Jeremy Myerson from WorkTech Academy. Thank you for listening.